Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, uh, wherever you, or whenever you may be listening. I am Tom Huntington. I am the editor of Aviation History Magazine. And uh, today I'm very pleased uh, to be here with uh, Nell McShane Wolfhart, the author of a new book, The Great Stewardess Rebellion, uh, which is a very fascinating book. And uh, we will be talking about that this morning. Um, before I do that, though, I'm going to give you a little plug for the magazine in case you have never heard of it before. And if that's the case, shame on you. Uh, we are Aviation History. We cover all aspects of the uh, heritage of flight, uh, balloons, powered jets, propellers, uh, military, civil and commercial. And obviously, today we'll be we'll be looking a little bit at the commercial aspect of, uh, of aviation. Um, so you can go to historynet.com, that's our website. Uh, you can read a, a treasure trove of material from the nine magazines in our history group, everything from the Wild West to uh, Civil War to uh, World War II. Uh, and you can also subscribe to the magazine on the website there. So I encourage you to do that. And now without further ado, um, Let's go back and begin the interview with Nell McShane Wolfhart and uh, the Great Stewardess Rebellion. Um, good morning, Nell. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I did find the book to be absolutely fascinating. Um, I, as I mentioned before we started the uh, the, the recording, um, I there were places in the book where I just had to put it down and shake my head in disbelief at, at some of the things that, that happened in the 60s and 70s. The, uh, the blatant sexism that uh, would would seem unrealistic if it were even on an episode of Mad Men, but this was real life and it really happened. Uh, so, I, you know, my my first question is, what was it that prompted you to to write this book? Well, I think every journalist spends a lot of their time thinking about book ideas. You know, we're always looking for, for, for the great idea. And I kind of processed a lot of them. And when I stumbled upon this one, it was actually during an interview um, with Adam Conover. He has sort of a TV show where he does myth busting. And he was describing to me that, you know, when we think about the golden age of travel, we think about Mad Men, we think about Don Draper, cocktails in first class, you know, roast beef, this extremely luxurious experience but how the flip side of that was that the women working the cabin, the stewardesses, I mean, it was the most sexist workplace in America. The working yeah. conditions were terrible. And he was telling me about this and I was like, hmm, that sounds like it would make a great book. And then I sort of ran off and wrote it. <laughs> yep. Well, I mean, it is an amazing book. Um, tell me a little bit about um, some of the indignities, I guess, if you could call it that term, that, that, flight attendants or stewardesses as they called them back then had to face back in during this golden age of, of air travel? Uh, well, there are many. And if, even to get the job, you had to meet a very long list of criteria. It had to be, you know, you had to have very straight teeth, for example. You couldn't wear glasses. You had to be a certain height and you had to be a certain weight. The airlines all had extremely strict weight restrictions that were determined according to height. So all the women on the plane were very slim. Mm -hmm. And at least at the beginning of the 60s, it was given that you had to be white. Um, so if you managed to jump through all those hoops and pass that test, uh, once you got on the plane, then you had to, well, you had to wear a girdle at all times. You had to maintain that weight because any manager or pilot could pull you onto a scale at any point. And if you were a few pounds over your weight, you could be taken off the flight. And then there was the, the limit of, two of your, of your tenure, because if you got married, you were fired. If you got pregnant, you were fired. And if you managed to avoid both of those things, when you turn 32, you would be fired. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just astonishing. Now, you structure the book, you pretty much follow a, a several main, I guess you could almost call them characters, but there are ma several people that are prominent and, and kind of symbolize um, the, the things they were facing as, as flight attendants. Um, what came first? Uh, did you start researching the book and then find these people? Or did you find these people uh, and then start researching the book? 
those two things happened at the same time. Um, the main, the two main characters in my book, I also sort of think of them that way, although they're real people and they're still no. alive and I talk to them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were, the, the two women I focus on, Pat Gibbs and Tommy Hutto-Blake, they sort of spearheaded this workers' rebellion, this, this revolution in the air. Um, and so their story is really bound up in the whole story of the stewardesses and how they managed to change their workplace. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like a personal transformation that happens along with a, a workplace transformation with a professional transformation. Right. Um, at what point did you, did you did you find them? Did you specifically seek out these people as you did your research? You said, oh, this is a very important person for this story I'm telling. So I, I, I need to get in touch with 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 her. Exa well, that's exactly what happened. Like those names came to the top almost immediately in my research. And then it turns out when you're researching a book on stewardesses in the 60s and 70s, that almost everybody you know knows a woman who was a stewardess in the yeah. 60s and 70s. It was a really popular job. I mean, it was a very exclusive, aspirational job. The airline sold it as incredibly glamorous, travel the mm -hmm. world, be free, be independent. Um, so it was very hard to get that job. But this really was the age at which air tra commercial air travel, as I'm sure your readers know, was really ramping up. And so they needed a lot of stewardesses. Um, and, you know, in the 60s, when you were a woman looking for a job, you could be a nurse, you could be a teacher, you could be a man's secretary, but those were kind of your options. And right. so stewardess, like if you were a little more independent or you wanted to get out of your hometown, stewardess really was a dream job for that. Yeah, it was also looked at on as, you know, in society at large, let's say, as kind of a placeholder job. It was, you know, it was fun. It was glamorous. It was a little frivolous and certainly not anything that anyone would consider a career. Absolutely. I mean, I think the average tenure of a stewardess in the 60s was less than three years. Um, I mean, most of them got married and they couldn't yeah. keep their jobs after they got married. So like they were gone. Um, and those those particular restrictions, the marriage, the pregnancy, the age rules, they sort of had the double effect of not only keeping this like the, the workforce very, very young and conventionally attractive, which was a way that they brought in customers. Right. But it also had the effect on those women themselves because, you know, it's not really worth your while to start fighting for things like benefits or pensions or pay raises when you only expect to be on the job for a couple of years. Yeah, good point. Good point. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, again here and uh, look at some some images from the book, which I think kind of sum things up. I think you can see that now. Let me go to the, uh, can you tell me a little bit about this photo? Now, this is one of your, your principal people uh, in this shot, I believe. Yeah, on the right hand side of the photo um, in the mirror, that's Pat Gibbs. She's one of, she's my main character, really, I would say. Um, and this is a photo of her at Stewardess School in 1961. So American <laughs> Airlines opened up this huge campus just to train stewardesses. And when you were hired for the job, when you'd passed all the, you know, the, the weight requirements and made sure you didn't have any unsightly scars or acne, you ended up at the stewardess college, which was colloquially known as the charm farm. <laughs> and <laughs> you spent six weeks on the charm farm, living in a dorm, eating in a cafeteria and being trained to be a stewardess. And some of the time was about emergency evacuations and safety procedures, but most of the time was about styling your hair in the right way, wearing the appropriate, you know, company sponsored makeup um, and you know, having your nails polished in exactly the right way. It was mostly about appearance. Um, yeah. And after you spent six weeks on the charm farm, you'd be sent off to your base. Yeah, and I, I recall an incident in the book where a, a flight attendant uh, spilled coffee on her uniform. Um, and did not have a spare uniform and was therefore forced to wear a, a uniform with a coffee stain and was fired for that. Is that, is that correct? Yes. Um, she was suspended for that suspended, uh, without yeah. pay. Yes. And it was, it was basically one of those restrictions. The uniform restrictions were incredible. Um, Pat, you know, the woman on the right in the photo, mm -hmm. she got a disciplinary and or incurred a disciplinary infraction at one point for not wearing her white gloves. Gloves were part of the stewardess uniform on an employee bus because she was supposed to be wearing her entire uniform, went out in public, even though the only people around her were fellow American Airlines employees. Right, right. So all these restrictions, these are sort of the, the little incidents that start to spark this stewardess rebellion because people like Pat start to realize that 
you know, being suspended without pay because it was a turbulent flight and a passenger spilled coffee on your uniform didn't seem quite fair. No, it did not seem fair at all. <laughs> um, let's look at some, some of the advertising. Now, this one, in a sense, was was better than the average because it does kind of dispel the myth that it's all glamour and that these these women, you know, because they were almost all women, did work very hard. But I don't know if you can see at the bottom of this ad, um, the little sort of word balloon coming out from the airplane says, she's going to make someone a great wife. Yeah, I think it's always, that's, that sums it up. I mean, these, these weren't, you know, serious workers. They were just, this was a placeholder job until they got married. The airlines absolutely, you know, uh, you know, worked on the image of the stewardess as a wife in training. And they talked about this, even when they had hearings and they went to battle over the age rule and the marriage rule, they went so hard on the idea that they were training America's wives, <laughs> you know, that their ad after ad talks about, oh, you're going to meet a woman who can serve meals to 150 people at one time. I'm not sure how many women were really required to do that on a regular basis <laughs> in the 60s or 70s, but it was like, it was a selling point, you know, that she was always smiling, always like perfectly, or, you know, arranged from head to toe, not a hair out of place. And something that you'll see in ad after ad, if you look at my book, there's a lot more of these. Um, and some of them are really outrageous, but that they must always be smiling. That was an absolute job requirement. Um, yeah. And in fact, when the term emotional labor was coined, um, Arlie Hochschild was referring to stewardesses because smiling was such, was absolutely like a job requirement it was something you couldn't get around they had to look happy while they were working so hard oh, absolutely i think the most surprising and, and appalling ad in the book is it was braniff who did a thing called the braniff airstrip in which the stewardesses would remove an article of clothing throughout the flight and you know they didn't get naked or anything but that was the implication of course that was actually, that ad I think came out in 1965, and that was the first ad that really started what I would consider sort of a downward trend into really sexualizing the stewardesses. Yes, Before absolutely. that, a lot of the ads were, were kind of like the one that you can see in front of you right now. Mm -hmm. They're talking about the hard work the stewardesses are doing, how they take care of their passengers. They're almost considered like mothers on the plane. And then with the Braniff airstrip, um, things really take a turn for for the sexual and they they posit these stewardesses as like kind of like flying like sky bunnies I think was a term that they tossed around a lot um and so things <laughs> um yeah some of these ads are, are really outrageous but they they get sort of more degrading as the years go by one of the the most famous ad campaigns I think of all uh is the fly me ad which you you still hear people kind of refer to that in conversation apparently and this was what what airline was this this was national airlines which no longer exists like many of the airlines like in my many book. of the airlines yeah um how, how did uh, I, I i recall that um some of the people in your book were I, a little ticked off about not only this ad but also the way people would treat them you know you know saying you know why don't you fly me you know and stuff like that that that's exactly right. So this sort of um, double meaning of these ads, like, and these ads were everywhere, and they featured real stewardesses. So the Cheryl that you're looking at right now, like Cheryl was a real working stewardess, and right. they had I'm Donna, fly me, or I'm Karen, fly me, and they even would paint those names on the planes so you could watch <laughs> like you know Cheryl flying by in the sky. Um, so this whole the whole I'm I'm Cheryl, the fly me ad um, was something that really sparked a lot of anger in, in the stewardesses. I mean, there had been incrementally worse and worse ads that mm -hmm. were really sexualizing them and trivializing their work, sort of encouraging passengers to treat them as you know cocktail waitresses right. rather than safety professionals. Um, and so ads like this were just making the problem worse. And this ad actually got them out on the streets picketing along with the National Organization for Women. They joined them yes. and they went and they picketed the ad agency in New York that had come up with this ad. And so they had signs that said, go fly yourself, which I thought was, <laughs> was pretty clever. And then this is another detail that I like. The owner of the ad agency, his name was Bill Free. He came out there and in 
a really spectacularly misguided gesture starts handing out roses to the pro to these stewardesses who are out there picketing, um, sort of trying to placate them. And so they go home and they make new signs that say, I'm Bill, fire me. <laughs> and you don't mess with the flight attendants. <laughs> As we're yeah. learning every day. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now they also had trouble with their own union. Um, and, and I, I believe they split off and formed their own because they felt they weren't being treated seriously by their own union. I, I think the, one of the sticking points was um, getting a single room um, for, a, you know, a, between flights. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting thing, just in terms of kind of all uh, union negotiations, is that the things that the public thinks are the most important for a job, you know, wages or benefits or whatever, are often not the things that the workers are really fighting for. Um, so the, the stewardesses were represented, most of them belong to the Transport Workers Union, mm -hmm. which was, you know, mostly subway workers, you know, bus drivers, things like that, a lot of a lot of old men, and they kind of treated the stewardesses like mascots of the labor movement. They didn't really go to bat for them when it came time to negotiate with the airlines for the things that the stewardesses wanted. Right. And one of the things that precipitate the sort of crisis in my book, when the stewardesses leave the transport workers and they go to form their own independent women-led unions, was the issue of single rooms on layovers, single mm -hmm. hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. So when you're, you know, when you're flying and you have a layover, the airline puts you up in a hotel and stewardesses had always shared rooms. There were always two to a room to save the airline money, but the pilots and, you know, the, the, the captains always got their own rooms. Right. Okay, fine. And when there were only women on the plane, which was true for almost all the domestic airlines until the early seventies, okay, they could deal with it. Then once men started coming on board in, I think, 1971, there was usually only one man, you know, working as a flight attendant on the flight, and he always got his own room. So, you know, the whole crew would arrive, get off the plane, they'd get on the bus or the car, arrive at the hotel. And these women who had been working the cabin for like maybe 10 years would have to share a room with each other while they'd see the man who had just come on board, like just started flying, saunter off to his hotel room with his, you know, with a key into his own, you know, solitary yeah. paradise. Um, <laughs> So this, <laughs> so this was one of the issues that really sparked a huge um, revolution among the stewardesses because the transport workers, when it came to negotiating a contract with American Airlines, they refused to go to bat for this. They yeah. just thought it was not important. And so the stewardesses, I mean, it's a little spoiler alerty, but they they vote down their contract um, two times, which is sort of something that was unprecedented. They rejected the contract that the transport workers had negotiated for them mm -hmm. because they said, we've been telling you, single rooms. We need single rooms. This is a single rooms contract. This is it. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's a lot of high stakes drama actually going around, something that doesn't seem that important to us as outsiders, but it was like a huge workplace rights issue for them. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you had a roommate who snored, then you would stay up and you'd be exhausted the next day and perhaps spill coffee in your uniform. You know? <laughs> and occasionally, like not only would they have to share rooms with stewardesses that they knew who had been on the same flight, but sometimes it would be a stewardess from another American Airlines yeah. flight and mm -hmm. the hotel, you know, the, the airline would just make them bunk together. So a total stranger and you'd, you know, a lot of them were like reading a book in the bathtub to avoid the light, keeping their roommate awake. And it was just, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it might seem like a small point, but it's a question of respect, you know, in, in a sense. Um, exactly. uh, I have another ad here, the, the boys with the Friday night faces. First of all, those don't look like boys to me, but um, <laughs> but this is the idea that these these important, you know, busy businessmen have to be fussed over and coddled, you know, by the, the stewardesses. <laughs> businessmen uh, like single male business travelers were absolutely like the everyone was scrambling to get this market share and that's probably still true today um, yeah. but these were like the most coveted passengers so all the airlines like this is one of the reasons that the airline ads get kind of racier and racier as the 70s go on because they're really trying to attract these men and com like convince them to fly on their airline and yes a lot of it are ads like this where it's like you know a stewardess is there to attend to your every need. She'll intuit whether you want to talk. If you want to talk, she'll talk. If you don't want to talk, okay. she'll leave you alone. She'll bring you the drink that you want. You're going to be like completely pampered by this young, very conventionally attractive woman. Like yeah. that's it. Um, I will also add that the 
increasing sexualization of the stewardesses resulted in some extremely bizarre uniforms yes. that, they, that the airlines put them into. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I think my hot pants. Hot pants, yeah. Southwest had orange hot pants and white lace up go go boots. And I just cannot even imagine the idea of serving hot coffee to a plane full of passengers wearing hot pants. No. Um, but that, that's just one of many. They get increasingly, increasingly weird and increasingly um, tiny. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, here's another one, you know, pampering, you know, the, the businessman passenger. Um, it, it's, it's a bizarre ad, I have to say, a very bizarre ad. Um, now, how does this all tie in with the rise of, of the feminist movement at the same time? It, it seemed like these were two converging streams that ended up kind of joining together at one point. Yeah, um, I think as, as, as the 70s sort of you know, uh, went on and the feminist movement really grew in power, there was this contrast between what the stewardesses were experiencing in their everyday life. You know sexual liberation, consciousness raising, you know, being out with like, you know, without makeup or without bras and, you know, long hair and just this incredible freedom that they were starting to feel in the seventies. And then, you know, when they went to work, they had to, you know, put on their girdles and put on their, their tiny skirts uniforms and be talked down to by passengers and by pilots and by supervisors really treated as girls. Mm -hmm. And, you know, girls was a word that the airlines used all the time to describe the stewardesses. They, they never referred to them as women. They always right, referred right. to them as girls. Um, so it was the increasing contrast between like what was happening outside on the streets and the sort of time warp that they entered whenever they like stepped onto the plane. Um, and you can even see behind me here, this is a group called um, Stewardesses for Women's Rights, which was a group, this was part of the group that protested the, the Fly Me ad. Um, they were a group of stewardesses who formed in, the 19, in 1972 in New York and a group of feminists who were, were all working stewardesses from all different airlines and their goal was to um, get, fight for, you know, better rights for themselves in the cabin. And Gloria Steinem was at many of their meetings. She was a, she was a huge supporter. Yeah. Which, which makes perfect sense. Um, obviously they, they, they made big changes in, in their working conditions, uh, and did make improvements. And, <clears throat> but now today you read about uh, things that even seem a little more horrific in which, uh, flight attendants are being assaulted on, on flights by out of control passengers. Um, and you don't address, go into that stuff in the book, but I'm just curious about your feelings about that. Have things gotten even worse in the skies? That's a really good question. And I think it goes back to what you mentioned earlier, which is respect. Yes. Um, you know, there is just a, has been a lack of respect for flight attendants since the 60s and 70s, since the airlines went went in so hard on this like, you know, sky bunny image. And you can just I mean, that just hasn't gone away. People still have that idea about flight attendants. Yes. And they also don't really believe that flight attendants are there, you know, in case of an emergency or as safety professionals. You, you know, they really think, oh, they're just here to bring me, you know, a, a tiny can of Coke and, you know, a right. biscuit or something. Um, so I think what we've seen, especially throughout the pandemic with, you know, people rebelling against mask mandates or, you know, getting very drunk on the plane and assaulting flight attendants. There was that incident with Frontier Air where that drunk passenger was groping the female flight attendant yes. and then I think punched the male flight attendant. And then they had to duct tape him to his chair because there was nothing else to do, um, which is like maybe an extreme example, but that sort of disrespect is happening all the time for flight attendants. And because they're you know, relied upon by the airlines to not only be you know, servers of food and safety professionals, but now also kind of security guards. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to working as a flight attendant, but I think a lot of people have quit over the last few years because they just can't handle the disrespect from the passengers. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's really a sad state of affairs. It is. Um, well, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to, to talk to us about the book. As I said, I just found it a, just a fascinating, eye-opening read, and I recommend it highly. Um, and one other thing I do recommend highly, um, and I should mention this one more time, is uh, Aviation History Magazine. Uh, if you don't already subscribe, you know, please do go to historynet.com um, and you'll find the buttons to push and uh, be able to subscribe quickly. So uh, please do that. Um, so I just wanna say again, Nell, thank you so much for, for talking to us about the book. 
Um, thanks for being a guinea pig, our first author Zoom interview. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. And uh, thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. Okay, good good luck with the uh, with the book. Um, thank you. you know, and uh, thank you very much.